Council meeting, roll call please. Council member Penrose? Here. Council member Moeller? Here. Council member Fraser? Here. Here. Mayor Kowalczyk? Here. Thank you. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Now proceed to proclamations and presentations. Get this down. And uh, we are adjusting to our new dais and new chairs. I will, I'm gonna stand tonight, see how that goes. We'll mix it up a little bit. Um, thank you for the letters. The, um, so proclamations and presentations. First, connect the co-side presentation. City Council members, my name is Rob Bartoli and I'm the project planner for Connect the Coastline from San Mateo County. Uh, I was here in October of 2015 to give you a brief update on the Connect the Coastline. I'm here for a, another update as well to update you on the progress of Connect the Coastline. So moving on to the first slide, uh, just uh, again a brief introduction. Um, we are, it's a I'm sorry sir, uh, yes. pardon me, I want to, uh, I need to interrupt you. If anybody, I forgot to mention earlier, if anybody needs tr uh, translation assistance, there are headsets on, on my left and Christina will be translating for us this evening. I apologize, please continue. No problem, thank you very much. Oh yes, and second important announcement that is um, also very important is that our restrooms are out of service. Um, <laughs> they are available next door at the EOC. Thank you, I apologize for interrupting. And that's very important information to get out to the public. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Connect the Coast site is the county's congestion management plan for the unincorporated mid-coast. Uh, Happen Bay is also part of the uh, study area and I'll get into a little bit more briefing on that. Uh, right now, just for the update, we're, we are at the point of Connect the Coast side of identifying and evaluating uh, transportation alternatives to address deficiencies within the transportation systems on the coast side. And we're also, uh, I will touch on our public and stakeholder outreach at this moment in time. Uh, the background, uh, San Mateo County is the project sponsor of Connect the Coast Side. We are doing this on our own. Uh, Half Moon Bay is included in the study area though um, because you are an important partner and we can't really look at the transportation systems, especially Highway 1 and Highway 92, uh, without looking at some systems that occur within the city limits of Half Moon Bay. So um, the Connect the Coast Side plan is to meet the requirements of the county's local coastal program. Um, so we have to address our requirements we have some recommendations possibly that Papua Bay may want to look at as part of the study. Um, but again, they are only to meet our requirements solely. And I also know that there are a bunch of projects from both the county perspective and the city perspective that are ongoing at this time. So I know it's a little bit unclear about some things and some things do have overlap, whether it's um, the Highway 1 mobility safety study, whether it's the general plan and update for the city of uh, local coastal program update for the city of Papua Bay and also for um, the Coastal Trail. So again, uh, we've included in Tapu Bay because it is an important transportation hub uh, on the coast side. Uh, we have conversed with uh, Happen Bay planning staff in particular and they have received lots of very helpful feedback, a very informative feedback um, at our technical advisory committee meetings. Uh, um, they have been a great partner to work with from the county perspective and I know going forward they'll be a great partner to work with as well. So I'd like to thank their staff that are here, are here tonight. So very briefly, because uh, I know you have a lot tonight on the agenda, I will just touch on some of the transportation analysis that we're looking at uh, for Connect the Coast site. Uh, during the county's analysis, we've looked at both the unincorporated areas, <coughs> excuse me, 
um, and the City of Heaven Bay Transportation Network. For the unincorporated areas, uh, we've been working on programs that will address the deficiencies on the transportation corridors. Uh, we've also looked at areas within Heaven Bay, like I mentioned. Our analysis should be looked at as a possible recommendation as the city looks moves forward with their local coastal program update and their general plan update um, as possible transportation alternatives and solutions. Uh, we've made some uh, areas that we've looked at have been road segments, um, intersections, bicycle, uh, pedestrian access, transportation access, including public transit, and uh, parking. One example of something that we've looked at in our analysis has been signal synchronization. So this picture here uh, describes the coordination of three lights that are in the city limits of Happen Bay. Um, one is at 1 and 92, um, and, the court, and where the bottleneck occurs under our analysis um, I'm coordinating those lights that, so that when one is green, the other is green and helps improve that traffic flow. The also is we're looking at is the mergers uh, when we go east on 92 and it comes down from two lanes into one and when you're heading north on Highway 1 when again comes two lanes into one, how we can address those merger issues. So that's just one um, potential topic that we're looking at. So as part of our outreach and our next steps, uh, I would encourage everyone that's interested in the Connect the Coastside project to go to our website. It's on there on the slide, uh, connectthecoastside.com. We post all our background documents. Um, PowerPoints are up there. Uh, contact information for county staff is on there and they have questions. Uh, we'll also be briefing the Mid Coast Community Council that everyone att uh, may attend on March 23rd at their regularly scheduled meeting. And we will be having a workshop, um, again, that for all members of the public, whether you live in Happen Bay or reside on the Mid Coast or just generally interested in the project. Um, that workshop has not been scheduled yet. It will either probably be, it will be in the beginning part of April, more than likely. Um, so if you're interested in attending that, please go to our website and sign up and you'll get notifications about when that meeting may be. So if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Questions from council? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think Jill was going to speak. Really quickly. Good evening, I'm Jill Ekes, the city's general plan project manager. I would like to take another moment of your meeting to share a few notes from your staff with respect to connect the coast side in context with Plan Half Moon Bay, which is the city's general plan and local coastal program updates currently underway. First of all, we acknowledge and appreciate our county staff colleagues in their efforts to keep us informed and we have participated actively and um, given input through their technical advisory committee and they've been really receptive to it and it's, it's been nice collaboration. Next, we pose a suggestion, hoping that this is feasible for Rob and his team, uh, for a C, uh, Connect the Coastside presentation to the General Plan Advisory Committee. The committee is waiting to dig into these forthcoming planning documents from Plan Half Moon Bay. The improvements proposed by Connect the Coastside provide real examples of ways to implement a number of the city's transportation priorities. So we, we think they could be of use and for, for thinking through as a great resource. Um, also, because the GPAC sessions are public forums and we know Connect the Coast Side is very um, thoughtful about their community engagement, this could support reaching some more people for them. Um, we think there are mutual benefits in supporting the synergy between our two planning efforts. Finally, uh, your community development director, John Dowdy, and I just want to reassure you that we will continue to stay in touch with our uh, county colleagues, follow the process, and provide updates to council and our city manager from time to time as uh, key points in their process come forward. So thank you. Thank you very much. Next item is the library summer learning presentation. Hi, Annie. Thank you, Mayor Kowalczyk and council members. Um, thanks for the opportunity to display a brief video highlighting our inspiring summers program. San Mateo County Library is delighted to be able to bring our high quality project-based summer learning experiences to 1,000 additional students in San Mateo County this summer because of funding through the Big Lift. 
In partnership with BELL, which stands for Building Educated Leaders for Life, the library will be supporting rising kindergartners and rising first graders this summer at El Granada School. The enrolled students will enjoy a full day of camp program made up of Bell curriculum in the morning and library curriculum developed in concert with the Center for Childhood Creativity in the afternoons. Each child will receive healthy meals, field trips, a home library to keep, and invitations to participate in several events to engage the whole family. Summer is a critical time to make a meaningful impact on learning and to advance learning gains, and we are looking forward to supporting and complementing local community efforts to ensure that many more children in the Half Moon Bay community are proficient readers by third grade. And so now we have a video um, from last year's summer learning program. You know, growing up in this area, I know that test scores, reading levels are, are typically lower, especially with the surrounding areas. So you know, I wanted to do something that might help change. We really look for ways to embed literacy in fun activities like science experiments or other inquiry-based activities where kids are working in teams and they're asking questions and they're focused on the process of learning rather than the product. We got to do activities fun. I try to think about this campus. We do yoga. great opportunity for them to improve their reading level and I love the programs that they have here especially for the English learner students. Working with the kid camps you really get to see the kids you read to them they get really excited. We did assessments with the children before and after. None of the children experienced any learning loss according to our assessment. So 100% at least retained what they left school with, which is huge. So really, really proud of that. Libraries have typically nourished minds now. Thank you, and I can take any questions if you have them. Any questions? Oh, great work, uh, Councilmember Penrose. Yeah, how many children are involved? Um, because of our space limitations, we had 25 um, participate last year, um, and then I believe we had 20 the year before. Um, this year, it's a slightly different program, so we're not sure quite how many kids we're going to accept. But it's two—I think it's two grades. It's the incoming kindergarten, incoming first. So, do you have more applicants than you can take? Yes. Um, yes, we did um, last year, and we assume that we will have more applicants than we can take this year as well. Thank you. Now, uh, represent representative from the Red Cross, I'm going to present a proclamation uh, for Red Cross Month. Thank you. So I just want to pass this proclamation to you um, as a representative of the Red Cross and just in recognition of Red Cross Month as, um, as well as uh, for all the help and support you provide to our community and to all communities. Thank you. Mayor Polchek, uh, members of the council, staff, um, I'm Jim Holly. This is Chris Orman with me today. We are disaster response workers uh, for the San Mateo County Office of the Bay Area Chapter of the American Red Cross. 
and we're really honored uh, to receive this proclamation from you that recognizes uh, March as Red Cross Month. And uh, I'd like to give you a, a few numbers in terms of what we do. Um, if we look at a, on a countywide basis, we did uh, 48,500, we collected 49,000 pints of blood uh, in the, uh, the, the county generally. We delivered uh, 26,800 CPR, AED, first aid uh, courses to folks. Um, we also introduced a very interesting program that um, we're targeting grade schools for. It's called the Pillar Case Project, which teaches children, young children, uh, about disaster uh, preparation. We also instituted a program last year in conjunction with local fire departments, which places uh, fire alarms in uh, vulnerable areas for free. And um, last year in the, the county, we had approximately 2,200. Um, we're best known for our disaster response, and uh, in San Mateo County, responding to uh, fires and other sort of emergency situations, we served approximately uh, 400 families. Now, if we look at San Mateo County alone, we served approximately 900 families impacted by fires or home floods or other mi uh, minor disasters, installed uh, approximately 318 uh, fire alarms, all for free. We trained uh, 11,500 people in first aid, uh, AED, um, and uh, we collected 1,900 pounds of blood, and also um, many folks realize, uh, p people with military experience, of course, know the Red Cross's role with military families, and we serve 42 families in San Mateo County for, um, um, in, in the military, with military-related issues. So. On behalf of the uh, ch chapter, the Bay Area chapter of the Red Cross and the San Mateo office, um, I'd like to thank you for this honor. While we have this opportunity, we also would like to thank the council as well as the staff for the preparation work that you folks are doing. You've set a benchmark not only for the county, but for the region in terms of what you do with the KEEP program and then also your, CE, uh, your CEC program, Coastside Emergency Corps. Uh, you're getting quite a bit of notoriety uh, within the Northern California area, certainly. So again, thank you. Any questions? Questions from council? Thank you for all the work you do. We really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is Mayor's announcement of community activities. I am aware of two and ask the council if you have any others. Um, Thursday is St. Patrick's Day. And to the immediate past mayor, I give you a tip of the hat. Seasonally appropriate. I see you seasonally appropriate. Thank you for that. Luckily the Irish. And then, um, uh, oh, Scottish, sorry. <coughs> sorry. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, I'll just announce that April 1st is Farm Day, and look for more announcements about the Farm Day activities coming up. Easter egg hunt next Saturday. Easter egg hunt next Saturday. This is the this is big one. Don't get this wrong. I believe it starts at 8 o'clock. Okay, we're we'll going I'm going to ask someone to do some investigative reporting here. We'll get the details of this because I know if you're five minutes late, you don't get any eggs. So it's it's the, the kids are, are highly skilled. So I'll report back on that. But Easter egg hunt is Saturday the 25th. Saturday the 25th. Thank you. Up at the high school. Saturday the 26th at the high school, and we'll confirm the time. Thank you. And next time I'll be more prepared with that. Um, next uh, report out from closed session to the city attorney. There were no reportable actions taken during closed session. Thank you, sir. And now to council reports to council member Penrose. I attended um, our academy, the net program, and met the wonderful 24, however many participants there were, delightful people, um, had a great time, excellent food. Um, I attended the KEEP meeting, the Coastside Emergency Preparedness Group, and um, had several good presentations at that meeting. And I participated in a webinar for the Joint Powers Authority for the um, Peninsula Clean Energy. Thank you very much. Council Member Muller. 
you, Mr. Mayor. I've uh, watched a lot of TV, and so uh, I did attend a, a net meeting, which is just amazing. Staff has just done a wonderful job, and all the participants, I'm hoping, gain a lot out of it. And uh, I watched a lot of city council meetings the last week, uh, not ours, and other meetings, and I think we do a pretty good job here, whether we all agree or not. So uh, hopefully, uh, let it keep raining for another week so I don't feel so guilty. Thank you, John. Councilmember Frazier. Thank you. Um, I attended the county's bike and pedestrian committee um, where we saw a presentation of the hazards of creating bike lanes, but that are in door zones. Um, a lot of cities are spending a great deal of money creating bike lanes for people to traverse, um, but they're too close to where the door is opening. So um, that's, that's something to be aware of because there is an increasing danger of that. Um, and I was also, um, I'm happy to say I was selected vice chair of the committee also. Um, at commute.org, um, they had a presentation. Commute.org is the association that helps with transportation around the county, and their motive is to reduce the single occupancy vehicles. Over 65% of us drive on our car all by ourselves. Um, so they really want to encourage more carpooling. Um, they're working on... Um, creating an app that will have, um, it's piloted now, but um, we'll roll it out and perhaps we can have it in the e-news when it becomes official, that can you can say where you are and it will show you all options that you can take. And there's also going to be something that's a closed system where if you want to carpool with someone, um, you'll be able to connect. Your information will be private, their information will be private, but um, try to connect people. Even if it's one day a week, it make a huge difference with people um, in their community. So right now, congestion's never been worse because employment has never been higher. So it's kind of the double-edged sword going on there. Um, but in also there's statistics. If you telecommute, people do telework, telecommute. If you do that one or two days a week, it can make a huge um, impact regionally on getting cars off the road. They've also created new shuttles that carry over 2,500 riders a day. And they'll continue to work with employers to match riders. Um, ride sharing as well as transportation hubs and connect that last mile. And the last mile is you might take a train, but you still got to get to your job and it could be a mile away. Um, at CCAG, we had a presentation on Energy Watch. We'd rolled out some programs and some seminars here on the coast. And to all the businesses, um, at least 10 projects were completed in Half Moon Bay. Um, and that was about an average of all the cities. There was eight, nine, and 10 projects that were completed. And that was um, helping businesses um, reinstall new LEDs and energy efficient lightings um, or whatever their energy was being zapped by there was some rebates toward that as well as water conservation too and um Energy Watch is working on a language for cities that can help um, with zero net energy. So they're going to start rolling out some guidelines that will help cities be able to adopt those and work with them in the future. And this morning, one of my favorite things I get to do a couple of times a year at the different schools is work with Rotary and Chamber talking to the senior high school students. And this morning, we were at Pillar Cedar School, the assistant superintendent, John Corey, and myself um, helping the seniors kind of acclimate what it's going to be like to go out into the workplace, how to interview, how to dress, how to talk, and how the all important, how to shake hands and look someone in the eye. So um, that's very rewarding and the kids were really great down at Pillar Cetus. And as John mentioned lastly, um, the NET program. Um, really great feedback from people and want to thank City Manager for bringing that to us. And we're going to be all together tomorrow night um, with a conversation with all of the folks who are in the NET program. So if you're interested in that, there's going to be more academies coming up up and hopefully people can go to it and we've got a couple of people in the audience that are a part of it too so thank you and I'll just add that the next Academy not yet scheduled but to happen this year will be uh, all in Spanish there'll be more information coming on that vice mayor Reddick 
Yes, I also attended the NET meeting. Again, that's our Citizen Academy. Uh, it was wonderful to see a lot of new faces from the community interested in local government. Often there's a disconnect. We get busy, we work, we have children that are, you know, playing sports, and, and we forget about our, our civic duties. Um, so there's lots of new faces. Staff has done a wonderful job making everybody comfortable with each other and with city staff and, and with the material. And I will be also attending uh, tomorrow evening. So I, I really think it's a, it's a great thing. And I went to two different uh, Sewer Authority mid side meetings. We had a, a budget session, first of several, I think, between now and the end of the fiscal year, which is June 30th. And also I attended last night a Sam recycled water committee. So we're, you know, we're we're pushing ourselves to come up with a 25% design, and hopefully we'll get some financial commitments from various parties to help move that forward. Um, one thing I did this weekend that was really exciting was I attended a program sponsored by the Youth Leadership Institute. We had a presentation by them at our last city council meeting. This is a group that's um, taking over the, uh, the youth commission, the county's youth commission. And uh, it was a school for financial literacy for um, young adults, college age and, and slightly older. And uh, it was absolutely amazing to see these young people and how informed they were about current events and, and actually have a pretty good handle on, on, on handling money and issues of economic justice. It was, it was so refreshing. And I, after that, I went to uh, the Coastside Democratic Club meeting where Supervisor Carol Groom spoke about um, all the goings on at the Coastal Commission. And she's the point person for the, uh, the Youth Commission and told her what a great program I thought the Youth Leadership Institute was. And I hope to remain connected with them and I hope the city will will too. So that's my uh, week. Thank you. As you can see, everybody's very busy doing events and activities related to city council. I have a few items to report. I attended two sewer authority meetings, the regular scheduled sewer authority meeting and the budget planning meeting. Um, we'll see the sewer authority budget come to council for review and then coming weeks or months, um, and we're going to look at it very carefully. It is not a small budget. It is a budget that the city helps fund substantially, and we have to be very careful with it. Um, but we have to do, strike a delicate balance between um, protecting our infrastructure, which protects our, our environment and our coastside, and also being fiscally responsible and doing our fair share and only our fair share. Um, I want to thank uh, Vice Mayor Ruddick for attending the Recycled Water meeting. Uh, I was traveling and uh, appreciate you covering me on that, so thank you for that. Uh, I also attended an event at the library um, that I believe is called Toyota, the Toyota Families Learning Program. Uh, and it was a great event at the library, kicking off another program where um, uh, they uh, provide a meal for the families and they um, have literacy programs and activities for the children and the families to do together, to learn together. Uh, and it was really great. Just another example of one of the many, many things, one of the many, many programs we provide to our community through our library. If only we had a bigger one. And with that, um, I go to city manager updates. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just two announcements. In the back uh, at the table, they're actually on the side here. We've recently published these little cards that are called Stay Connected. It's a way to sign up for the community newsletter as we want to be able to get information out to the community. And then the back side has some key phone numbers of um, the city hall. So those are available in Spanish and in English. And also wanted to remind the community that on uh, Tuesday, March 29th at 6.30 uh, here will be the next uh, library, library community meeting. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we'll move to public forum. I have a question for... Uh, for Dave Olson. Dave Olson, you, have a, you, you wanted to talk on item 1J. You, you want to just comment on that item, or do you want to pull that item for additional discussion by the council? I did not realize it was on the consent agenda. Uh, yes, I would like it pulled for additional. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I'll note that here, sir. And I've got a public forum. I have a number of cards. Everybody will have three minutes. Um, 
first person up is Mr. John Ullum, followed by T.J. Glottier. John Ullum, thanks for having me up here. Uh, probably about three, maybe four meetings ago, it was brought up that um, that uh, there might be a better use for the uh, uh, Half Moon Bay uh, Jail in the Half Moon Bay uh, barn. And uh, it was at that time uh, indicated that this issue would be discussed at the city retreat. From the people I've talked to who were there, this issue wasn't discussed then. So I did a little bit more research. The city's got a, a big problem there. There is no lease between the people who are in control of those properties and the city, as far as the city can find anyways. There hasn't been one since, I believe, 1994. There is no certificate of insurance to show that the property is properly protected. And that is a requirement that was in the original lease. The city has not been able to produce any certificates of insurance for the last 20 to 30 years. So uh, that'd be uh, something that you need to look into. Uh, maybe you could consider bringing this up again because it is a huge liability for us to be running something like this without a certificate of insurance, without any proper uh, agreements between the people. It should be known that um, the organization that has control is basically a defunct organization that has lost its tax-free status because it didn't file. And the organization that has it is also uh, not a, a, a tax-free charity anymore. They've lost their status as such. So we got a, some sort of informal agreement that nobody can explain that isn't quantified in any way. It appears they have nothing that comes back in any real value for most of the year. The, the jail is almost always closed. There are no hours that I've been able to find as to when it's open. The barn is closed what, 350 days a year. So anyway, it might be worth considering that you follow up on the commitment that you made to discuss this, because you didn't want to discuss it then, so maybe we need to put it on the agenda. Thanks a lot. Thank you. TJ, followed by Bob Gordon. Thank you, uh, Mayor Kowalczyk and uh, council members. I'm TJ Galathier. I live in Moss Beach. Uh, my wife, Bridget O'Farrell, and I would like to uh, first express our appreciation to the County Board of Supervisors for uh, working with you to arrange the loan that you'll be considering later tonight on the agenda. Um, the work of Don Horsley and Carol Groom and Dave Pine and the other Board of Supervisors members has been uh, very helpful, and especially for those of us in the unincorporated area. We appreciate what they've done. And we certainly uh, urge you to approve the loan later on tonight. And the conditions couldn't be more favorable in terms of no interest and deferring the payments until after the Beachwood payments uh, end. The other point that I'd like to talk about, though, is the so-called Taxpayer Protection Act, uh, which is still going to remain on the ballot in June, the primary ballot. Um, First of all, I'd like to express our appreciation for your sharing the letter from the board bond council at your last meeting so we could begin to understand the implications of that whole measure. And we're very concerned uh, about the fact that it could really inhibit the operations of the council in the ordinary, ordinary business, of course, of the normal things that you do, um, because it can affect any financing other than financing that is approved by a general vote of the public, so that it looks to us like it might even affect your approval of the budget every year, that you'd have to go to a four-person vote. If your budget includes any leases for office copiers or vehicles or anything else, any kind of financing that is multi-year financing would seem to be triggered by that. So we urge you to, to consider that, and we urge the citizens of Huffman Bay to vote against it. Um, I've spoken to you recently or in previous meetings about some of my experience with financing vehicles like lease revenue bonds at the federal level from my time in the Clinton administration. And I'm still involved in some of these things at the national level. For the last 18 months, I've been co-chairing a commission that was created by Congress and the administration to review all the national energy laboratories, laboratories like the SLAC laboratory at Stanford or Livermore and the Berkeley lab. There are 17 of those around the country. 
And among the things we looked at were ways for them to do better financing of their buildings and facilities and infrastructure upgrades because as we all know, the federal budget is also constrained. We're also uh, oper operating often under continuing resolutions or other things that really inhibit general financing. And uh, last week, I was in Washington meeting with the Department of Energy, people at the White House, people in Congress, about exactly these kind of things, how to, make, how to find easier ways for the laboratories to do financing. So we would urge you, I would urge you, to consider those kinds of financing vehicles in the future when you do come up with needs to finance things that can be done within the regular budget, financed in the regular budget, do not require a uh, shareholder or a, a public vote, uh, to go ahead and consider those. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bob Gordon, followed by Shirley McCauley. Good evening, council members, uh, members of the public. My name is Bob Gordon. I'm head of a subcommittee of the San Mateo County Tobacco Education Coalition, and we're working to eliminate the sales of tobacco in pharmacies. We work closely with community-based organizations such as Youth Leadership Institute, Breathe California, uh, North County Prevention Partnership, as well as local pharmacies such as Half Moon Bay Pharmacy and doctors, dentists, and dental hygienists. Now I know that many in this room have lost relatives and friends to tobacco-related disease. I personally lost uh, my grandfather to cancer, lost a great-grandfather to emphysema, and also a very close cousin to emphysema. He was given his first pack of cigarettes by the United States Army when he was sent off to Vietnam. And uh, 42 years later, many years before his time, he died gasping for every breath. Our Tobacco Education Coalition respectfully asks you to consider a future policy that would make it so tobacco retailer licenses are no longer granted to pharmacies and drugstores. You may not know, but eight other California communities have already done so, starting with San Francisco in 2008 and most recently in Daly City. The four drugstores that were selling tobacco saw their tobacco retailer licenses expire January 1st. Now, why work on such a policy in Half Moon Bay? Well, we know that our young people frequent local drugstores, and when they arrive at a front counter of a drugstore with their purchases, they often see a huge wall of tobacco products and all the Marlboro and Camel advertising associated with it. Community members and their elected leaders do have the power to decide that local pharmacies will not sell tobacco and therefore the power to change what a pharmacy is for a whole new generation of kids. So with, will this type of policy alone solve the fact that we lose 480,000 people in the United States every year to tobacco-related disease? Um, no, but it will allow Half Moon Bay residents to have a say in creating a healthier community for its youngest and most vulnerable residents. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Shirley, followed by Monica Ackerman. Good evening, everyone. Council members, staff, and community members. My name is Shirley Holly and I've become interested in learning more about city doings so that I can participate in city government more intelligently. I have enjoyed being part of the NET program as a way to get to know city staff and functions. It's been uh, fun and uh, educational. Over the last year, I've been impressed by the improvements in openness, courtesy and responsiveness to citizens who bring concerns to the City Council. And I strongly support Mayor Kowalczyk's 2016 priority from his State of the City address to foster one city. That is, an inclusive city for all of us, including our Latino neighbors. I'm looking forward to the establishment soon of a council subcommittee. I've heard the names of Marina and Debbie Penrose as possibilities 
to begin addressing the issue of affordable housing in town. As we all know, this is a pressing issue. We are losing working families who cannot afford to stay here. People are living, families are living in a single bedroom, exorbitant rents, and although we do not provide social services, we can collaborate with other agencies to solve these problems. We can learn from other cities who have approached these difficulties effectively and with creativity. With active involvement and sponsorship from the City Council, citizen participation can be solicited. So please, the time to take action is now. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. And related to that, I know that Council Members Fraser and Penrose are preparing uh, an outline for a future meeting on this topic. Uh, Monica, followed by Alan Elefano. Good evening. My name is Monica Ackerman. I'm also a happy member of the uh, NET Academy, and I, I enjoyed meeting you all in person, and it's been fabulous. Um, I was disappointed to see that the smoking ordinance was no longer on the agenda, and I don't know the reason. And I don't know if it's going to be on the agenda again, and how long we can wait to make these rules about outdoor smoking. To me, that's a health issue, and it's very, very dangerous for young people and old people like me who have heart disease to have to walk through cigarette smoke. The sidewalks are not meant for smoking. There are no ashtrays. People throw their cigarettes in the street. And I heard an argument that I would like to dispute. The tourists aren't going to like it if we have a no smoking ordinance in the street which is crazy. Most of the tourists that come are from California. The ones that are not from California are from smoking countries and they think we are crazy. Whenever I go, I was born in Austria, whenever I go to visit and I tell somebody I'm really bothered by secondhand smoke, they say, you must be from California. So I think that if we have signs that say no smoking within or whatever, here or there, they're going to take pictures of it and have a laugh because they think we're crazy, but we're also healthier. And I think that this is something the city council should consider putting back on the agenda and doing whatever studies necessary to see the impact on not just us, but all the lovely people that come here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ellen Alifano, uh, and then I've got, oh, then followed by Christine Tapia. Evening, member, um, Mayor Kowalczyk, and council members, and esteemed staff. Um, I know you don't hear this too often, but I think it's important that occasionally people come here and thank you for the things you've accomplished. And I know you've been talking about what the accomplishments have been, but I don't think it's wrong to continue to talk about what's been accomplished and what's still left to be done. The Pillar Cedars Bridge, I think it was pretty amazing how quickly the council got together. Even when people from the state of California came here and said it'll take three to five years to repair that, replace that bridge, and the city did it, I think, in less than a year. That was pretty amazing. Um, renovated MacDutra Park, I go by there almost every day and I see people sitting in chairs, having lunch and talking. And that's a major improvement to, our, to the core of our city. I want to thank you for that. And I would highly recommend you consider on the back wall where the stage is of having a seal of the city, of the new city seal, painted on that wall. Because I know a lot of people would love to stand there and take pictures showing Half Moon Bay in the background. Um, the general plan effort, I know that's not an easy thing, but it's something that has to get done and um, it's costing a lot of money, but it's, it's, it's a great effort that's finally happening. The paving of our streets, I know we've got a few really bad ones left, but um, I commend you for pushing through that and getting them, hopefully getting them all completed. The new boys and girls gym, seeing that uh, going up, the foundation started, <clears throat> that's really positive. 
the skate park next door. It's a shame they had to break the water main, but that's okay. That's what happens with progress. And lastly, the new Coastside Library. I mean, we'll talk about more about that later, but it's really impressive to see all the difficulties, all the obstacles that have been put in the path of this new facility and how our city has found ways to answer all of these issues. So again, I want to thank you for what you've done and please don't stop. Your job is not to come here and just pass an ordinance or two or let the city, uh, the public come and talk, but it's to make things happen and improve our city. I don't believe a city that stands still is the kind of city we want to live in. We want a city keep our city keep improving. So again, thank you. Thank you, sir. Christine Tapia. And then I've got three cards from a student presentation. Did you want to present independently on mass? Um, seriously. Sincerely, great. So followed by Laura, Nina, and Tom. So, Christy. So, good evening, everyone. Um, this is my first meeting, so thank you for this opportunity to speak with you as well as everyone else who is in attendance. I just wanted to bring up real briefly um, regarding composting here in Half Moon Bay. I know that I have emailed with uh, Farm, uh, former mayor in the past re in regards to this issue. Um, I know that there are quite a few people within our community who would like to compost and that we are hoping that in the future that we can have a contract with our refuge company or um, garbage company that will include composting. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Congratulations on your first meeting and hope to see you again. So our serial presentation from Laura, Nina, and Tom. Tom's going to go first. Tom and then whomever else. Yeah, and then Laura and Nina. Tom Wilkins, 229 Miramontes Avenue, Half Moon Bay, where I've lived since 1989. Uh, having moved to Half Moon Bay directly from Tokyo, Japan. And uh, as founding member of the Half Moon Bay Sister City Committee, um, I was asked to uh, be the first presenter um, from the Sister City Committee tonight to um, talk about funding. Uh, a brief history of the Sister City Committee for those that don't know about us and haven't read the many articles over the years in the review and uh, come to some of our events that we've held. Um, we created the committee in November of 1993. Makes me feel old just to say that number. Uh, in April of 1994, I stood right here uh, and presented um, our case to the City Council 22 years ago, uh, doing about the same thing I'm doing now. Uh, and that was also when we began our youth art exchange with Hatch Elementary School and Kariwa Elementary School in our sister city in Japan. Um, in October of 1995, we had a delegation of 17 dignitaries from our sister city in Kariwa that came um, specifically for the uh, Pumpkin Festival. They rode in the parade, in, uh, and the chief of police and the fire chief uh, in their full uniforms rode in the parade um, as Naomi's guest. That was October of 1995. And that weekend, we also had the commemoration of the Sister City Agreement. And that certificate of friendship is hanging in City Hall today. Our first student exchange program began in the summer of 1996 uh, with our first set of Half Moon Bay High School students going to Kariwa and we have facilitated the exchange program uh, every year alternating Kariwa students coming here and then in alternate years the Half Moon Bay High School students will go to Japan. So this year uh, represents uh, 20 years that we've had this student exchange program and we've sent 19 Half Moon Bay High students, two of whom are here, and they'll follow me as soon as the buzzer rings. 
Um, we had funding from a grant until roughly 10 years ago when the grant ran out and we made a similar presentation here to the City Council and we were awarded $6,000 in 2006. When those funds ran out, our committee had to ask the parents of the students to assist with the funding for the transportation to and from Japan, which sometimes meant that certain students may have been left out because they didn't have enough money. Um, so we would like to ask the council to consider a small amount of funding to help us continue this very worthwhile program. Uh, and we'll be sending you an email tomorrow detailing the outlines of the, pro outlining the details of the proposal. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our students. First, from uh, 2010, when Laura Acton went to Kariwa, and then followed by Nina Bachicha, who went in the summer of last year. Laura. Hi there, my name is Laura, um, and as Tom just mentioned, I went in 2010. Um, first and foremost, thank you for supporting this program in the past and continuing to support it potentially in the future. Um, even though it's been six years since I went to Japan, it still comes up in conversation. I still think about it on a frequent basis. Um, and that's mainly because my experiences in Japan, um, or my, my trip to Japan was without a doubt the most important trip I've been on to date. Um, at the time I was 17 and the Sister City program gave me my chance to fully experience a completely different world and a completely different culture. I think being able to do this at such a young age is something that can be extremely beneficial because for me it gave me the chance to step back from my what had become my normality, my day-to-day -day thoughts and processes, things that I do, um, and I was able to realize that um, different ways of life, different cultures, different things that are going on around me are just as beautiful as what I experience in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and I think overall that started to build an underlying respect for cultures, different people. Um, and that's something that is important for um, high school age students, especially before you leave Half Moon Bay and go off to do other important things with your life. Um, Something that was also extremely beneficial was the fact that I was able to represent my city as a student ambassador. Um, I was able to learn about civic engagement in that respect. I was able to learn about what it was like to really be involved in not only my community, but in um, connecting another community in that kind of a way. So while I was growing this appreciation for new cultures and new ways of life, I was also um, I was also growing my love for Half Moon Bay. I felt honored to be a representative of this community in that way. So that's why I think this trip is extremely special and why the opportunities presented by Sister City are um, important to young students at Half Moon Bay High School. And I hope that through some kinds of collaboration, we can try our best to make this opportunity available and easily accessible um, to students of all income levels um, for years to come. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Nina Bachicha. I went uh, this past summer to Japan. Uh, with one of my fellow classmates, Evan Impink. Um, I have similar feelings to Laura about the trip. It was probably one of the greatest experiences of my life and one of the most educational. Um, our host families just took us in from day one as part of their family and really immersed us in Japanese culture. Uh, it was incredible to learn so much about customs and the language and the food from a country that's so different from the US. and. It's really great to have connections to another family on the other side of the world, which is something like I've never experienced before. Uh, Evan couldn't be here today, but he wanted me to um, say that 
I'm glad that the program gave me the opportunity to travel to Japan and experience a new culture. It was a life-changing experience and it was, a wonder it was wonderful being chosen to act as an ambassador for our city and to meet the mayor and citizens of Kariwa. I hope to return one day either to study during college or to teach English. With the support of the city, this opportunity would be available to many more students. And I agree with uh, Evan. It would be great if um, more students could be able to have the same experiences as we did. And I think it's really important to have the opportunity to travel before you graduate, especially in such a small town. It's really eye-opening. It can really change what you want to do. Like Evan wants to um, maybe teach English, and I definitely want to continue traveling. And just the lessons I learned when I was in Japan were so incredible. And they're the kind of things that really can't be taught in a classroom. So it'd be really special if um, more students had this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for sharing. I'm sure this item will come back to us for further discussion at some point. With that, we move to the consent calendar. There are a number of items to pull. I'm going to pull 1B, 1E, 1F, 1G, 1I, 1J, 1K, which leaves the consent calendar with items. The items for discussion at this point, I'm sorry, for, for a motion, if you wish to make one, are items 1A, 1C, 1D, 1H, 1L, and 1M. Is there a motion at this time? I'll make a motion to approve on the consent calendar 1A, 1C, 1D, 1H, 1L, and 1M, and for the other items to be placed at the end of the agenda. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor respond by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to um, item 3A, agreement with the County of San Mateo for an advance of funds for the proposed new Half Moon Bay Library project. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Alex Kojikin, Deputy City Manager for this great city. The item before the council this evening is the agreement with the County of San Mateo for an advance of funds for the proposed new Half Moon Bay Library. So a little bit of background. The Half Moon Bay Library project is a collaborative project of with project partners with the City of Half Moon Bay, the County of San Mateo, and the Library Joint Powers Authority. Uh, we've been working together on this project for almost a decade and really working significantly over the last two years uh, to gather community input, getting conceptual updates, hiring a project manager, hiring an architect, uh, having a community survey, and um, figuring out the financing for the project. In 2004, um, there's a restated library JPA agreement. Uh, the, the city is part of the library, San Mateo County Library JPA um, with other cities in the County of San Mateo. Specifically in that agreement, um, there's a section in which uh, the county uh, with half of the patrons of the library coming from the unincorporated area will pay half the cost for any type of remodel or uh, rebuilding of a, of a library in Half Moon Bay. This was further memorialized um, in an agreement uh, between the city of Half Moon Bay and the county of San Mateo. Uh, the council approved that agreement back on October 20th. And then the county board of supervisors followed up with uh, their approval in December, uh, memorializing that 50% or half contribution for the project. On December 1st of 2015, uh, the library project came before the city council. 
to discuss the library, the library size and the associated budget. Uh, the council gave direction to staff to move forward with a 22,000 square foot library um, with an estimated cost of $22.8 million. Some background continued. The, as I stated before, the estimated library project cost is $22.8 million at this time. Uh, the library pro project agency contributions. So there are three project partners, as I stated earlier, the County of San Mateo, the city, and the San Mateo County Library. The city and the County of San Mateo will each, uh, with the projected estimate budget, would uh, contribute $10.85 million and then the San Mateo County Library Joint Powers Authority will contribute $1.1 million for furnish, furniture, furnishing, and equipment. Currently, to date, the city has uh, put in reserves for the library project in a capital fund, Fund 16, $6 million. The county has budgeted $12 million, uh, which was approved back last June for their two-year budget. And the library, JPA, has $1.1 million for the funding. The unfunded uh, contribution currently that exists for this project is an outstanding $4.85 million, and that is this part of the city's contribution to the project. In order to ensure the timely completion of the library project, on March 8th, 2016, the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors approved an advance of funds for the city of Half Moon Bay. Um, that advance of funds is up to $6 million uh, for this specific library project. With that advancement, the, the county is advancing the funds interest fee for a 13 year period. The city would start its repayment um, three years thereafter from, from this current fiscal year, uh, starting in uh, December of 2019. And that coincides with the city paying off its Beechwood bond debt, um, which is currently, our annual payment is $938,000. If the, full, if the city borrows up to the full $6 million, the annual city repayment will be $600,000 for a 10 year period starting in 2019. There's no prepayment penalty with this agreement. Upon execution of this proposed agreement, the Half Moon Bay Library Project would be fully funded. The city's financial advisor for the library project is Kitahata and Company, specifically Gary Kitahata. He went ahead, I, we've attached a memo, to, a memo to the staff report, and some of the highlights in his conclusions were that this, the, the advance funding uh, that is interest-free interest -free would be the best possible way to finance the city's contribution for the new library. The county's proposal is interest-free with no upfront costs and with repayment deferred until after the judgment obligation bonds are fully repaid. The fiscal burden on the city's general fund would be minimized and any other type of financing that the city could structure at this time uh, would cost more upfront and over time. So the recommended action this evening is to adopt a resolution authorizing the agreement with the County of San Mateo, whereby the County of San Mateo will advance funds to the city for construction of the Half Moon Bay Library Project. Here's some library drawings, and this concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from council? I do have some blue cards. So here from the public? Yes. Okay. First blue card is Deborah Hurst, followed by Hope Atmore. Oh, so Deborah came with her three-year-old and her five-year-old who looked at us with hopeful eyes and said thank you in anticipation of what's about to happen. And um, it was very, very sweet of her to bring them, her children here to talk to us this evening. Um, Hope Atmore, followed by John Ullum. Thank you, Mayor Kowalczyk and council members. Um, I'll be very brief. I just want to tell you how excited I am, because you've seen me up here so many times talking about this library. Um, I did go to the Board of Supervisors meeting last week, and not only was I excited, but the Board of Supervisors was excited for us. And there was sort of a almost tangible excitement in the whole room about 
our library and what it's going to mean to our community. Um, since that since that meeting last week, I sent out some emails to various people, and I've gotten amazing feedback from, back from uh, friends of the library members, as well as just other community members, talking about how exciting this is and what a great thing this will be for us. Um, now that we finally have that certainty to move forward, we're we're all really looking forward to working together and, and seeing some a, sort of a unified front as we go into this process. Um, I also want to let you know that the Friends of the Library is still fundraising. We uh, we don't look at this as our our stop time for fundraising. Our goal of raising as much money as possible is still very much there. Um, it's still our hope to reduce the debt that the city has to take on, um, even if it is interest free. And we want to see as many community members participate in this process and hopefully also donate to this library fund in order to reduce that debt and also just to feel some ownership in this process. So um, again, I just want to thank all of you for your hard work on this and tell you how much fun it's going to be to have a groundbreaking and a ribbon cutting at that new library. So thank you. Thank you very much. John Ullum, followed by Ellen Elefano. I just want to say that was congratulations, I guess. That was, we kind of got schooled on this one. Um, as you know, that uh, we were told, all of us here, all of us were told that this library couldn't be built without measurable. All of you said that. I'm sorry. All of you, the ones who were elected that time, said absolutely this library could not be built without passage of Measure O. Didn't pass. Didn't pass by very much, but didn't pass. So then you decided you wanted to go with lease revenue bonds, which was an effective way of not bringing it back to the people again because they didn't give you Measure O. So we might as well just do lease revenue bonds because there was nobody in. Nobody could stop you. So that was pretty clever. And then some people did try to get a hold of, you know, the, the rate that a debt is being applied to us. Because it is debt. And it's going to be paid back by sales taxes, which means the lowest common denominator in our society, people like me, who pay the majority of our sales, you know, pay a lot more in our income in sales taxes, are going to fund your library. So don't kid yourself, there is no free money. Someone over in San Mateo County is paying for our library. So you decided to use lease revenue bonds, and then some people collected 947 signatures. And about eight months ago, they went and they turned those signatures in, and that got you the uh, Citizens Taxpayer Protection Act. And since then, you've spent a lot of money with your lawyer, and apparently a lot of people coming from out of town telling us why we should not have a supermajority on the board vote for to impose debt on us. And I believe what we're seeing here tonight is a perfect example of why we need the Taxpayer Protection Act. Because eight months ago was when we turned in the signatures, and eight months ago is when Don Horsley says that Marina Frazier came to him with this great idea for a tax or for interest free money for the citizens of Half Moon Bay. Maybe it's just a coincidence, maybe all this is just a coincidence, maybe none of this is meant to stop citizens from having a vote on whether they should uh, require a supermajority to impose debt upon us. So there's lots of stuff we need and there's lots of creative ways to impose debt on us. Congratulations. Thank you. Alan Alifano. A tough, a tough act to follow. I think it's very interesting how when this process first got started, it was amazing watching the different roadblocks that got thrown up. It reminds me of one of those action movies where somebody's on the back of a truck and they keep throwing tires and, tr and things off the truck to keep the good guys from catching up with them. So if you recall, the very first thing was fi financing. The financing was bad. But at the time, really, if you think about it logically, 
in order to keep the project moving, the city had two choices at that point. Lease revenue bonds, which is just nothing more than a loan, or GO bonds, which would have forced a vote. And that would have meant that one third of our community could have stopped the library, which I don't think anybody wanted to see happen. And that also would have put the burden directly on our taxpayers on their property tax bills. The really good thing about taking money out of our general fund is a huge source of our income is hotel fees and sales tax. Property taxes is actually a very small part of our budget, as you all know. So it's really nice to see that the tourists in our town, the people staying at the Ritz and the other hotels and eating at our restaurants are gonna help us pay for our new library. And after the financing tire came off the truck, then it was, there wasn't enough public input even though he had had a lot of public input previous. So the council then restarted that process and the meetings were amazing. There was a lot of negative uh, concerns at the first meetings I went to, but as they continued and the staff and the consultants were able to answer the issues, it was amazing to see how the tenor of the meetings changed from negative to positive. And one of the issues was not enough parking. Well, that got resolved. Then the other issue was the library's too big. That got resolved. And we're at the last one now, which is finally finding an answer to financing. And it's a wonderful answer. It doesn't mean we don't have debt. We still owe the money to the, to the county, but the interest rate's gonna be a lot less, which is wonderful. But the whole point here is, you can't let the people on the truck throwing tires off the back derail things. That's not what should be happening. What has happened is everything that was thrown at the city has been answered and resolved. But I don't think it's over. So please keep your guard up and please keep moving forward. But again, thank you for what you've done. And by that I mean the people that saw the tire coming and said, okay, there's gotta be a way to handle this. And they went and found answers. It doesn't mean the county comes to you, you have to go to them. It took the extra effort of people to find answers. So again, thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll bring it back to council for discussion. Any comments? I was... I was going to make a motion to adopt a resolution authorizing the agreement with the County of San Mateo, whereby the County of San Mateo will advance funds to the city for construction of the Half Moon Bay Library Project. I second it. We have a motion and a second. Any comments for, or discussion? Councilmember Muller. Yeah, I, I just want to make it very clear that uh, I've been sitting here for a lot of years on a lot of boards and commissions, and I don't govern on threats. Uh, I think uh, there are 6,500 voters in this city. They have to realize the importance of infrastructure and moving forward. And if 900 plus names are turned in, that's not going to threaten me to continue to pursue what is best for our city. And I think that's showed up by our relationships and our professional staffs for the last year plus working. Uh, anyone can throw dates around, but let me tell you when uh, I can remember back over 60 years of visiting with boards of supervisors as a kid in the 50s. Uh, they always respected the coast, they respected our heritage, they respected uh, the people that lived over here and now the people that are moving here and they knew they wanted to help and they're in a position to help. So I think this is a great county-wide effort. I was with Mayor Rich Carbino of South City yesterday and he just, I was waiting for him to give me a little uh-oh and he was like, Thank God. Uh, Quentin Kopp called me today, our former senator and judge. Quentin Kopp said, great job, San Mateo County and Half Moon Bay. So I'm not going to govern by threats, and I never will govern by threats. So I think we're governing in a proper way with this uh, uh, motion. A motion and a second. Other comments? Oh, I have some comments. So I want to clarify one thing in the staff report. Staff report referenced the source of funds to repay this would be property tax. That is not the case. It is city revenues, which includes property tax and other revenues, I believe. Is that correct? 
per the agreement, um, where where it'll be coming from is the property tax, actually. And if we can't cover that with property tax, then it'd be any other tax. Got it. Thank you. Um, then the when I spoke to the Board of Supervisors uh, at their last meeting, to prior to them voting on this item, uh, the things I shared with them, I want to share with you. Um, one of my goals, one of our goals, but the thing I really pushed for, for li regarding library financing, everybody knows, everybody, we all want the new library. That's that's a given. Um, I, I, I safely speak for the city council in that regard. One of my goals was to try to find a way, the best possible way to fund the library without putting additional taxation on our community. We had a measure O option that came up for a sales tax increase, which was a strategy to try to to um, use uh, visitors, tourist money to help fund the new library through the half cent sales tax. It did not pass. That was for an array of projects, not just for the library. Uh, that didn't pass. We didn't give up. We said, there, let's think of other strategies. We identified lease revenue bonds as a great vehicle that would um, allow us to fund the new library without a sales tax increase would allow us to use the savings for paying off our long-term debt early to fund the new library. Um, and that's a fine option, and it's a fine option for other major projects. And then, thank you to the initiative of um, Councilmember Frazier and to look for even better financing option. You get no better financing than, no in, than a no-interest advance. That it, This doesn't happen, and when it does, it's pretty remarkable. Um, I'm thrilled that we can do this for our community. And the thing I shared with the Board of Supervisors was this. This is among the greatest gifts we can give to the community, the children, the adults, the seniors. We'll look back on this as being one of the greatest things we've done for our community. And I, I couldn't feel more strongly about that. Um, I think this is, um, you know, we're not done yet. Um, those tires, I guess, I love that analogy. Those tires and debris keeps coming off of the truck in front of us, but let's keep our foot on the gas um, and let's do the right thing for our community, of course, um, and continue with this project. And with that, I'd like a roll call vote, please, unless there's more comments. Just say quickly, um, we do have Deputy County Manager um, Peggy Jensen in the audience tonight, and um, her staff had worked so well with, with our staff to make this come to fruition, as well as um, Tom is a part of the library administration and Annie, as everyone knows, is our librarian. Um, and as most people, if they've heard my comments through the years, I've asked for money for a library since 2000, um, even going to state librarians 10 years ago. and. Uh, the, hearing back from people who used to be our county um, supervisors who were involved with this. Some of them in Rich Gordon when he was on the Board of Supervisors. Senator Jerry Hill, um, we were actually part of the JPA together when he was on the county and he had nominated me as chair of the JPA Ten years ago, and said maybe this will will help Half Moon Bay um, have a library. So you know, a, a long journey with so many people and so many supporters. And we certainly have to thank the friends. I think the friends' initiative of starting to raise money really um, displayed to the county that there was such um, great community support, and people were going to be very active about it, not just stand by. So um, I think that's important to recognize. Um, everyone has had a piece in this, and will continue to because it will um, reflect and have another 40 years as this library has stood for 45. You know, we've got decades and generations of people who will benefit from this. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I would like a roll call vote, please. Council Member Fraser? Yes. Council Member Muller? Yes. Council Member Penrose? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Vice Mayor Reddick? Yes. Mayor Kowalczyk? Yes, absolutely. And with that, I would like to thank you. Before we take a short recess, um, so as not to waste a moment, I'm going to sign the resolution immediately.
recommend everyone stay and join us. Those cupcakes the are there the for you. The Is the there the mayor. something? To so thank you. So please, uh, we'll have a ten. We'll adjourn for ten minutes for cupcakes and treats. Thank you. And then I'll call up Mr. Allum. Actually, let's just go to, uh, I think it, this is Warren's, right? Yeah, Warren. So uh, John Allum um, asked to pull this item. John. Ah, I'm going to throw a tire here. Uh, just real quick, uh, it seems that uh, we've spent a lot of money on our lawyers this year. Did some math, and we were up to $350,000 as of December 31st is what we came up with and that was the budget for the year and so I know that there's no way for a citizen to find out what exactly we're spending that kind of money on because you just won't answer it or he won't but it would be nice to hear you guys talk about your your legal fees because they are quite high thanks thank you so was that for warrants or for treasurer report one visa is warrants. Warrants. Okay. So, um, thank you for your comments. Is there any discussion from council or a motion? Um, I guess there's an answer to that about the. He, I think he's actually talking about the treasurer's report. The. So, uh, Yuli, thank you, Yuli, you have a comment, please? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, so I think that this question is related to financial report, and we did mention that um, uh, the encumbrances for city attorney's budget already fully exceeded. So the way we've process, uh, processed these um, invoices, we encumbered the entire budget up front in front of the year, well, at the beginning of the year. And the actual spending for the city attorney is actually below expected at this point. Uh, we exceeded, I believe, about 40% of the budget. Um, so, Yulia, may, I, may I inquire, so is this, in essence, paying a retainer, if you will, for the year? And then well, I want to understand how this is working. The, the way the city attorney's budget is structured, we have the lump sum amount for the general um, services and um, some amount for the litigated cost. So I believe this question was about the general matters and um, the way we process the payments, we encumbered the entire budget up front. And then we received the monthly invoices and processed the billing. So that's, I think, where confusion is. So the entire budget, the entire budget is shown as spent on the financial report, but truly what we've done, we just encumbered this budget. If this helps. <laughs> So the quarter two, we only spent about 40% of the budget on the city attorney. And, and what would that 40% be in terms of a number? Uh, I believe it's about 160,000, something like that. I can double check. So I would just say, do you understand what we're saying here? So it, what it shows is an encumbrance, but not an expenditure. And that expenditures are only about 40% of the budget. Of the budget. So, if, so to the city manager, I would appreciate just a, a short memo to the city council on this topic. Email. It's it's simply an encumbrance. So the entire budget for city attorney is three hundred and fifty thousand. We only spend about one hundred and sixty-eight or forty percent of this at the end of second quarter, and that is what in your report today. And the only reason it's showing 100% because we encumbered. I understand. We expect to spend it through the rest of the year. Great. Is there a motion? No, no irregularities. Is there a motion? To approve the warrants? To approve 1B. One, one I move that we approve item 1B, warrants for the month of February. I'll second. Comment? 
Yeah, I believe uh, there's no irregularities. I think it answered the question on, it does look a little bit complicated that way, but I think uh, we're definitely well within our budget for our city attorney fees. So I just wanted to make uh, the public aware of that. Thank you. I have a motion and a second on 1B. Uh, all those in favor, respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Moving on to item 1D. No, I'm sorry, 1E. Um, 1E, I think, is this? E is an Edward. E is an Edward. So uh, for item 1E, there is a, an error on in the and the report saying that the project was awarded on September 1st, 2016. I believe that hasn't occurred yet, so I'm sure it's 2015. With that correction, I believe there's no other questions. I'll entertain a motion. Move to adopt a resolution authorizing additional project funds in the amount of $195,042 for the 2015 street reconstruction project. Uh, uh, with, uh, may I suggest an amendment to include this, the changes? And to include the change of moving from September 1st, 2016 to September 1st, 2000. For a motion and a second. I'm sorry, for a motion, is there a second? Yeah, I'll, I'll second. And you have to remember, I had a lot of time to read this weekend, staff. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> motion and a second. All those respond, in favor, respond by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Item number 1F, I'd like a 30-second flyover from staff, please. <laughs> 30 seconds. Um, this is a request to um, contract with Biggs Cardosa Associates. Biggs Cardosa Associates was chosen by the um, Main Street Bridge Advisory Committee um, to um, assist staff and the city in uh, developing the grant application for um, the rehabilitation project for the Main Street Bridge. Thank you. I asked for this item to be pulled um, because uh, I wanted to ask the question, is, is there a timing constraint, um, is there an urgency for timing f uh, regarding these grant applications at this time? There is no absolute time sensitivity um, to this. Um, there are two things sort of leading um, to a desire to move this forward. Um, one, obviously we have a grant application that is going to likely expire right now for that. We've been encouraged to apply um, for the grant funding by the funders and uh, that typically is a good sign and I think what their desire is to in essence roll the money from our existing project over into uh, the rehab project. Um, by losing and not taking that opportunity at this point, you lose potentially their interest and their commitment to the project. So my concern is this. Um, we are in the middle of prioritizing 28 projects for our capital improvement program. And right now this project, as of last year, the project of the bridge rehabilitation was fairly high on the list. Uh, we've now had the engineer's study uh, that reported the bridge's sound, so we got new data. Um, and my suggestion is, is to wait to see, wait on this item and the following item to see if uh, the bridge is still among the, the top 10 items for, we want the city to work on in the coming year. So the reason being, if it's not, then it is, it may very well be, but if it's not, then let's spend our resources, meaning our time, on the things that we are saying are the most important. I think the words that, uh, you know, or the words that bulletproof of regarding the, somebody, some engineer used that regarding the bridge. So if it's structurally sound, then is the data saying that our urgency isn't what it, it is, is our urgency out of line with what it should be? And I think when we prioritize our CIP items, maybe it'll still be high on the list, maybe it won't be. But my, my position is let's hold on this item until we uh, complete the CIP process. I, I beg to differ as um, working for a grant maker myself, I, I think that it would be um, 
not a good idea to not move when the when the funders appear to be interested because it's very easy in a very competitive environment to, to lose interest and to display you know um, a less than urgent attitude about it I think we we want to demonstrate interest and that means acting when people want us to act when the when the money people want us to act so I, I would be inclined to um, approve this resolution this evening so question for staff is there the message from the funders uh, would you describe it as encouragement or would you describe how would you how would you describe the messaging from the funders better question as positive as you could ever get Caltrans to be on anything, um, this is about the most positive I've ever seen them in terms of the fact of apply for this and then we can talk about everything you want to do and, and how you want to proceed with it. Thank you, sir. Uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion unless there's more comments. I'd like to move that we adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute professional services contract with Biggs Cardoza Associates, Inc. for technical services related to a grant application preparation, negotiation, and pre-design work for the Main Street Bridge Rehabilitation Project in an amount not to exceed 50000 Is that correct, Nope. No. Nope. We're not approving that one. <laughs> How about you? I think you say item 1F. <laughs> I move that we adopt. I move that we adopt a keeps turning off. Okay. I move that we adopt a resolution one authorizing city staff to submit an application under the highway bridge replacement rehabilitation program for the Main Street Bridge Rehabilitation and two, authorizing staff to seek and apply for other grants that may become available for rehabilitation of the historic Main Street Bridge during the remainder of fiscal year 2015-16 and all of fiscal year 2016-17. I have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. I pulled item 1G for the same reasons. I no longer have those comments. Is there a motion for item 1G? I move that we approve item 1G. Is there a second? I'll second. A motion and a second. All those respond by saying, in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. I, uh, let's see, item 1I, it's still I. And I would appreciate, appreciate an introduction from staff. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, each construction project um, by contract uh, provides the opportunity for staff to retain a portion of their uh, of the contractor's payment um, to preserve the opportunity to come back and to correct issues that were not addressed um, properly at the time of construction. The Mac Dutra Plaza, we retained $20,000. The applicant, um, Half Moon Bay Grading and Paving, has requested 17,500 of that back. We've recommended um, for consideration a $15,000 um, to be retained, a $15,000 to be returned back, 5,000 retained for paint and other related work. Thank you. I ask this item to be pulled, um, and I, I don't support re uh, changing the retention at this time. There were um, items that were done incorrectly in the plaza that need to be corrected. Uh, one example is that galvanized steel um, railings and structures were not treated before painted in, um, in conflict with direction they were given. Um, appreciate that they very proactively painted things, but they very proactively painted things wrong. Uh, that needs to get corrected. Um, and so, and then I have some questions about some of the paving that is showing signs of wear. Uh, the park has been open six months about six months. So, uh, so some of the concrete is showing signs of cracking and um, I, I'll 
at six months, I don't expect that to happen. So I, wanted, I would like to have an evaluation of that. I would like to not uh, refund their 17500 nor their 15000 uh, and keep those funds until such time as the items that were done incorrectly are corrected. And that's my position. Any discussion from council? There was some um, mention of waiting until the weather changed to see what happened in the next couple of months, so maybe waiting to reevaluate it in the summer. I'm, I'm fine with that, either to see how things progress in, in a two months' time or, or resolution of all the, of the items that are not, were not properly uh, uh, constructed. Well, I, I think we have to be careful uh, when we have a lot of events there also by, by taping and putting things up on the, on the different structures there that uh, paint could peel off. And then, as you said, uh, your experience of mine is that when you're dealing with galvanized uh, metals, you have to be cautious on prepping, number one, and number two, uh, you know, use the right materials. And then uh, my other point is that if hopefully we're in good faith uh, uh, working with the contractor, uh, we've signed an agreement with them to get it done right. We do have some timing to get done, but I don't want to be sitting here as people that authorize contracts and then go back on them. And that's just my point of view. Yes, I would never want to go back on a contract, but I would always insist that we do things right. Um, my recommendation is no motion on this item, but if anybody would like to make, make a motion, I would entertain that. Hearing no motion, I'd like to move on to, should I make a motion? Well, uh, well uh, my motion is to not approve it, so I don't, no motion is fine for me, unless it's just direction. I don't think we need to have a motion on this item. We're not required to have a motion on this item, right? Is, so to the city attorney and city manager, is that appropriate? Okay, thank you. So moving on to item, 1J. And I do have a card, and this is comments from, from council. I'll ask Dave Olson to speak, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'm Dave Olson from El Granada. I'm a member of the Midcoast Community Council, but I'm speaking as a private citizen tonight. Um, as I'm sure you're well aware, we've had a lot of erosion up on the Midcoast. Um, some of it successfully dealt with so far, some of it not. Um, I would like to suggest that on this contract, uh, you request that the uh, contract be amended. I would like to suggest that the contract be amended to consider moving the trail and any infrastructure such as storm pipes further back from the bluff rather than armoring the bluff. Uh, the reason I suggest that is in this particular area, there is lots of room to move back from the bluff and consider a managed retreat scenario. Uh, this is not a developed area. Uh, we're not looking at losing buildings. Um, and I think that even if the bluff is armored, the infrastructure will eventually have to be moved. All you're going to do is delay things. Uh, the other problem is that as we've seen over and over again, armoring um, tends to cause beach erosion, uh, and that is a very nice beach in that area. It would be a shame to lose a lot of it. And the other thing that happens when you armor is the areas adjacent to the armoring almost always suffer increased erosion. So uh, I think this is a very appropriate area to consider managed retreat rather than armoring. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, actually, I, I neglected to ask staff for the overview of, of the item, so perhaps if we could um, um, provide us some additional background uh, around those comments and around the project. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, again, this is a request for um, dollars to uh, do design for temporary emergency repair. Um, we're not talking about permanent erosion, we're not talking about permanent repair, permanent armoring. What we're talking about is trying to pre preserve and protect the existing coastal trail between Kelly and uh, Seymour. 
um, and we need to look at how to how to address that issue. Um, and that's and that's what this is about. We agree that down the road we're going to have to look at bigger picture issues um, in terms of potentially having to move it inland uh, from where it is. But that is a huge undertaking, a huge permitting issues, land ownership issues, and a lot of things um, that that go with that. And so this is a first step of trying to preserve and protect um, basic um, infrastructure that's there buy us time to be able to come back and look at the bigger picture of whether we realign, um, look at, at other options uh, with us. The other thing I would say is that unlike uh, some of the areas like in Murata and some of the areas where the armoring is of concern and surface beach even, um, we're talking about actually areas that are well away from the surf zone and from um, erosion. These are erosion that are basically being caused by runoff from uh, from Half Moon Bay and from the, the hills above and unincorporated areas. So it's not so much driven by beach erosion and they're well away from actually from the surf interaction and zone. It doesn't mean that those areas aren't going to interface at some point with sea level rise and other things. But at this point, um, there is, a, I think, a distinction in that um, regard from the repairs that we're looking at at this point as opposed to Marat or Surfers Beach or other areas where they're directly in the, in the surf zone. So what would potential interim fixes look like? Do we have an idea of what those might be or what might be alternatives? Well, the easy answer is whatever um, the Coastal Commission will accept. Um, we have talked and met with and walked the site with the Coastal Commission staff. I think there's a recognition that we, in the interim period, probably are going to need to drop riprap um, and rock um, riprap into that area and to just try to hold it tight. We also um, need to look at what we can do in terms of the pipes and making sure the pipes um, are not broken and we're not losing um, more, you know, water coming underneath the pipes and other places. So there's a, a host of things that we need to look at both on the inland side of the of the trail as well as on the actual bluff side um, of the trail to try to deal, deal with this. And that's why the design is needed for them to evaluate, look at it, come back with suggestions which we will then pose to Coastal Commission staff for um, would this be acceptable as an emergency um, and temporary erosion process. That kind of concerns me only because that's potentially a lot of riprap you're talking about. And that can cause, as we know, uh, down coast impacts eroding those areas that are not protected. So this, this kind of concerns me. If, if, if really riprap is the, the only thing we're, we're, we're talking about, I, I would almost want to step back and consider, you know, alternatives and the longer term fix. Um, uh, say this. Stay on. Um, we're looking at the design only and we're going to look at, 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 at options that are available. Um, certainly we can take council's directive on, on looking at options beyond that that was um, contemplated. Um, anyway, um, we would have to come back for any contract for any work that would be done beyond this point for the actual repair work and you would see exactly what is being proposed and what the limits of that um, and to the extent that it's necessary whether we would require sequel review or other review as part of that so um, but it's it's council's call it's a it's it's um, an issue that it's not going away but it's also you know it, it will be there tomorrow so this item is for design and engineering services around options. I think what you're hearing is there's some interest in options that go beyond, um, I guess, what might seem to be the obvious choice of riprap and some and, and other alternatives. And I don't know what those are, but but uh, but John Muller has a thought. Yeah, and I, th I think we've talked about this before when we're talking stormwater. Uh, we have to continue to look at a calming flow. How do, how do we divert? How do we calm if there's an opportunity to move the flow to a slower area? Then we got to look at that, and I think that's maybe what we should be working towards. I, I, 
I believe, though, we do have to at least make an effort and get some perspective on how serious this is going to be and continue to be. Um, so I just, you know, emergency erosion repairs, it's, uh, you know, it's almost like when there's a disaster, just throw everything into it. But let's try to uh, be a step ahead of that. Thank you, Councilmember Frazier. Um, thank you, and I appreciate Mr. Olson coming here tonight, expressing his concerns. I know he's very active in our, our bluff tops. Um, I think we do need to, you know, put, put some money into this to get an overall study. What the determining factor is for the short term, I'm not sure, but I do think we're, we're going to have to look long term for so many things. Just. Um, an area on the, the King Tide Day, I think it was last November, um, and I went back there this week. There was a huge chunk, and this was over by Murata Surf, that has already fallen in. Um, it was had fissures and cracks, as well as the same fissures and cracks over along the other areas. And, and I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of the coastline eroding um, through the years. So we may have to be realigning a lot of the trails. I don't know that Rip Rap is the answer. We've seen the problems with that. Um, as has been mentioned, it affects things downstream. Um, but I'm okay allocating funds here to at least start some studies to see what it was, what is the best way, because you're saying it will come back to us. Um, what, the determining, what the determining solution is? That's correct. So I have a comment, which is, what if we do nothing? But so, what's what's so? This is to do a study to look at what our options are for emergency repairs. Um, I'm not sure I know exactly which area you're talking about. So tell me, what, so there, what's um, the what's the short term risk of not addressing it? Well, there are. Um, there are about there are at least five locations where there's pretty been pretty significant um, erosion, um, and um, there's at least two locations that I've been to and walked um, that are within about four to five feet of the edge of the of the trail. That's where the edge, and you look down, and it's 30, 40, 50 feet down to the bottom of that crevasse. That's a significant problem both from the perspective of the trail and the long-term viability of that trail. And I agree with the idea that we're going to have to look at some um, coastal retreat um, idea here at, at some point. Eventually, the bluffs are going to be moving inward, and we're going to have to look at that as an option. But this looks at that. So th that's, that's, the, that's the concern, is that we have both a safety issue, which, was, which we could address separately from this if, if um, by fencing and doing um, things of that nature, which will require permits because we're in the Coastal um, Commission's territory at that point, um, or we can look at trying to retain and protect and, and deal with that in a combination of things. But we have trail that's within four, five, six feet um, of those areas, and that's the concern. And doing nothing, we may be done with storms and we may be done with high tide for a while and nothing might happen beyond that point. Okay, so it, it is, uh, I guess it's uncertain, but there is some risk. Vice Mayor? So I'm guessing that one of the sensitive areas might be the dump, you know, face, you know the, the part of the trail that's um, along the, the county dump. Actually, the... the <laughs> That's certainly an issue for the county. They're very concerned <laughs> about that and, and any idea about uh, bluff retreat and, and anything um, that relates to that. Um, they're very concerned about what that means and they're looking at that in Daly City and it's not um, an unusual, unfortunately, occurrence. Um, the ones we're looking at is where the particular one that, that, that concerned us um, is where the Myrtle bubble comes out, the Myrtle, um, the, the ditch that comes out from Myrtle Street and runs out um, to um, to the bluff and that's where you've got about five feet now of, of, of soil between um, the, the trail the paved trail and the edge of an abyss uh, down because the the drainage pipe is has blown out that area there's um, 
no indication that, is, that the, the surf has made it all the way into there, but it's basically dealt with because of the, the drainage coming out of there. There's another site where the pipe is actually broken. You can see it in pieces, and it's blown out and gone in a similar way. And there are three other spots between Poplar and Kelly that are of a similar issue. And those are the areas that we're concerned about, obviously, from protecting and um, trying to prevent um, that from occurring. We have to look at the drainage issue, but when we did the drainage work and the drainage plans that went to the state um, for, um, for drainage maintenance that we just did this year, those areas along that point were, were removed from that project because of the problematic nature of permitting and the issues there. And so we did not really look at those and the maintenance needs and the issues there. So this is going to take a very um, involved process and a lot more money than 45000 dollars for the long-term kind of corrective action that needed there. Um, what about considering a, an expansion of scope for this project to look at um, potential retreat alignments or at least looking at the ownerships and looking at what sort of issues we would need to address to retreat? You know, whether it's rolling easement or just, you know, include information that we might need to address a long term. As long as we're looking at this now, looking at that segment, I would say. perhaps throw in a, additional money for uh, an enhanced scope to look at those sorts of issues. What would be involved? We, we could certainly come back with that. And, um, <laughs> We actually have another, we had another proposed contract coming the next meeting um, to talk about the longer term issues and to come. I just didn't want to confuse um, the, the two contracts and the work there. Uh, but one of the, the issues that we're sort of dealing with is, a, is that we need to actually resurface the trail. And the question, you've raised some very important ones, which is do we spend that money, do we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to rehabilitate and repair and repave um, that existing uh, trail until we actually have a plan for um, potential retreat and, and, um, and, uh, and relocation. So um, I, I think we could come back with a, with a proposed scope that deals with some of those issues. So I'm, I'm thinking that there's potential grant funding for coastal trail planning. So if we were to expand this scope somewhat to get some, you know, basic information about where a new trail might go, you know, we'd be positioning ourselves to apply for grants um, for planning and potentially construction too. So that's so I'm going to that's suggest a, a variation on that, and, um, which would be I want to ha handle it as a separate item. That way, we're not holding up one item for the other, and ask that that, that come back to us. Uh, let me offer that as a suggestion. But I know uh, Councilmember Muller had a comment. Yeah, just very briefly, if it if it may help the Vice Mayor, I see part of the recommendation would be to analyze and study local drainage conditions too. So I don't know if, if that would cover the concerns we have. It, it's not just drainage. It would be looking at um, it would be gathering data that would be necessary to determine, you know, future alignments. And certainly the, any drainage issue there is going to impact any new trail that's set back. So, I mean, that's fine. That, that's an important element of, of this scope. But I'm just saying throw in a little extra to do this additional data gathering so that we can make an informed decision. Rather than approving a separate contract to look at these things, why not, while they're out there, and I think they're probably perfectly capable of gathering this data, you know, maybe it's, I don't know how much more it would be, $5,000 or whatever, but... Then if... if, if if that is the desire and, and a shared interest, we can certainly come back on April 5th, um, March, April 5th, <laughs> I think where we are, April 5th with the revised scope, we can get an estimate of what that would be and scope that out and bring that back. And um, I, I, we're, the extra 15 days uh, is not gonna be the end of the world for anything. 
if there's uh, if, if there's a, that sort of consensus, we can do that as direction to staff. If there's not consensus, we can certainly discuss more. Um, regardless, um, what is our ability to legally mark those locations uh, and, and remain aligned with the Coastal Commission? I am the unfortunate father of a child who rode her bicycle down one of the ravines along the coastal trail, and you can imagine one horrified child at the time uh, to do that. And uh, I would not want anybody else to experience that. We can certainly evaluate that and, and discuss with our local um, coastal staff. Um, so what, so my, uh, my suggestion is that evaluate it and whatever action we can take, let's just take it, whether it's orange cones. So I, I don't know what we can do, but I'd like to make sure that those are well marked so that we don't have any anything unfortunate happen to some, some children. Now regarding this item, uh, I, there's some, some momentum to continue it and bring it back with some additional scope. Is that the direction of council or is there other, is there other discussion we want to have? I'm, I'm, I'm getting nodding heads, so we're going to continue this item with the uh, direction to staff. With that, we move on to <clears throat> item 1K. And I have a brief introduction from staff, please. Thank you, Mayor, Council members. Um, we uh, recently um, the city man, the city man, the city engineer um, convened the traffic safety committee, um, which is an internal staff um, committee, to evaluate a number of requests um, and uh, posed by residents as well as some posed by staff um, to look at various locations within the city. Um, the staff report includes some recommendations, including modification of the current uh, resolution, which approves all of the regulatory signs and markings um, in order for those areas um, to be enforceable by the Sheriff's Department. They have to be approved by council. There are some regulatory signs that are just subject to being regulatory signs. This package includes those that need to be um, acted upon by the council. Um, we have received uh, commentary and letters from uh, the Filbert um, Street folks. Um, I think you'll hear about that. We recognize um, the imperfect nature um, of this issue and certainly uh, welcome their comment and um, certainly are open to uh, reassessing our position on that issue. Thank you. So um, with that, so regarding the, uh, regarding Filbert Street, can you summarize, is there any activity planned per your staff report that affects Filbert Street? Um, our recommendation is, is sort of a threefold one. One is that uh, our suggestion is to, we would add two additional, one each direction, um, 25 mile per hour speed limit signs. Um, we're looking at sort of an enhanced sign that talks about residential district and uh, issues. We're looking at some um, means and methods to slow folks down as they come off of Highway 1. What would an example be of a mean or method? Meaning we're looking at there are rumble strips, there are markings, there are ways to slow folks down as they come off of there, which is not dangerous to the motorists, but certainly gives them an indication that something's changed when they've come off the highway. So we're evaluating um, some of those and uh, with an engineering firm is, um, is looking at some of those options um, and also a warning sign about coming into a residential area. Thank you. And with that, I've got one card from Hope Atmore. Hope. And um, Hope also presented us with a list of signatures from her community. Would you speak to that as well? Thank you. Um, so obviously I'm here just as a resident of Filbert Street this time. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you about it. Um, I saw that there was a recommendation for two additional, I'm assuming additional, speed limit signs. There are already two speed limit signs on Filbert Street, which were installed about five years ago after all of us complained about people speeding. And I can assure you that it's made very little difference. Um, I don't think that putting two more speed limit signs is going to make them slow down. The people that are speeding are very well aware of the fact that they're speeding. I don't think that they care very much about the speed limit signs. Um, 
We, you know, since five years ago, neighbors have continued to complain. Some neighbors even put cones out in the middle of the road to try and slow down the traffic. We're doing anything we can to try and slow down the traffic. And it's not just coming off of the highway, it's going toward the highway as well. Uh, people treat Filbert Street very much like a freeway to Main Street. They think it's the straight shot, there are no stops, there are no stop lights, and they use it that way. Um, most recently, one of my neighbors made her way around the block on her cane getting signatures that she turned into the city quite a few months ago, and I don't know whatever happened with those. Um, so today I decided to go around and double check with the neighbors again, and that is the list you have. I think I got about 80% of the neighbors on the 600 block to sign. The only ones that didn't weren't home, and that was the only reason, but I've, you know, I, there's not a single person on Filbert Street that doesn't see this as a major issue. And what I thought was really striking was that every single person I talked to pretty much was able to give me their sort of close call story that they've had when they were either backing out or when their pet went across the street or their child. And it's just a matter of time before something happens. There have been multiple accidents on the street, especially right at the corner of 4th and Filbert. Um, so what I would really like to encourage is that the city look at you know doing some more research on this, but doing it as quickly as possible or implementing something sooner. Um, one thing that we have suggested is putting stop signs at 4th and Filbert so that it's a four-way stop. Because at least then, as people are coming off of Highway 1 or going toward Highway 1, they know that there is going to be a stop in the middle somewhere. So they won't speed up to 55 or 60 miles per hour trying to get out to Highway 1. Um, some neighbors asked about speed bumps. Other neighbors were very much against speed bumps. But you know, we would like to see something done. It's bad in the morning. It's bad in the afternoon. It's bad on the weekend. It's Cunha drop off and pick up. It's Seacrest drop off and pick pick up. It's it's really just across the board. So I hope that the council will look into doing something besides just two more speed limit signs because that's really not going to help. So thank you. Thank you, Hope. How would you feel if we put four speed limit signs? I think that would four times as much not help. I agree. So. Um, <laughs> I agree as well. So uh, I'll bring it back for comments, but I have some comments and I'd like to start. Uh, the uh, Thank you for bringing this to our attention. Thank you for so quickly getting this, the signatures from your community, illustrating your support, uh, their support for some, some activity here. So I don't know traffic engineering. Um, it, I think having a reminder of the speed limit can be helpful. It feels very light. Um, I would like to suggest regardless what we do here, I've heard from many neighbors on Philbert Street about the activity, the speed of cars and this kind of thing. And I would like to ask that we invite our sheriff friends to pay a little attention to that, to make sure that perhaps if there needs to be some presence and some reminder, um, a great way to give that presence and reminder is to perhaps spend a little time patrolling that. And um, if somebody breaks the rules, issue some citations that will also quickly address that. But um, my opinion is I would be in favor of adding the stop signs as was suggested by the community and be responsive to that unless there is some reason that I'm not aware of why that would be a bad idea. And it sounds like a very good idea because I'm well aware this is a problem area. And with that, those are my comments. I want to hear from the rest of the council. Councilmember Frazier. Um, whether it's stop signs, speed calming devices, or some whatever, um, it, it is very dangerous because we have the increased traffic down in the south end of town, um, both on Main Street, but the stop sign by the new senior village has helped slow down some of that traffic because people pick up speed. We've seen speed calming devices slow down traffic on Johnson. Um, I think we need to go back and look at what studies were done and, and how complete they were before because there was the rubber tubing across the road which I believe was the counter to determine how many cars were coming. If, if I am um, read what Caltran has done before to determine the speed, the rate of speed, you need the two rubber lines and there's probably some technical name whatever they're called but it goes across um, to do that so um, it is very dangerous just coming from if you are from the south on a bike off your bike just trying to cross filbert you cannot even get in the middle of the road people have come in from the highway and you're a sitting duck right there 
So a stop sign may be an answer, but I think we need a true study, an engineering study, to what is the best way, because that is a heavy, heavy traveled road now, both with the stoplight that's been mentioned and the more activity that's, that's down in the south end of town. Councilmember Muller. Yeah, no, I, I uh, you know, if we, we look throughout the Bay Area now, uh, stop signs are very, very popular. And I, I have no objections to uh, putting a four-way stop at uh, Fort there, personally. Uh, but again, as a elected representative, if I had a dollar for every uh, constituent that wanted a stop sign, I wouldn't have to be sitting here because let me tell you, we all want stop signs, really, even though we roll through them. So uh, I think it's something that uh, I don't want to have a lengthy study to figure this all out again. I think it's imminent, and I would uh, caution our... Uh, friends on Filbert and residents that uh, I can remember as a child, uh, two wrongs don't make a right. I don't appreciate the uh, neighbors will continue to take matters in their own hand with all respect. Uh, that's pretty harsh. We got to obey the laws and let's hopefully let the municipalities do the right things to calm that street down. I mean, no matter what we look at, and some people live over there, when you're going west off of Highway 1, it's a flyer. Everyone is flying down in those neighborhoods, and uh, I think the other areas I think I'm pretty comfortable with, but I really would like to see us uh, be able to uh, get into that and uh, see if we could calm that down there. Councilmember Penrose. What is the cost of putting in a stop sign? couple thousand dollars probably at most I mean it's the the stop sign is not it, the cost of stop sign is is not the issue it's whether it's, it's whether it's the appropriate action to take I don't think we need to spend a lot of money to try to figure out what the appropriate action is you stop people with a stop sign it seems pretty straightforward much more effective than a speed bump Vice Mayor. See if this works. Um, so I know from my own experience with Poplar Street in my neighborhood, the only thing that has slowed traffic down on Poplar Street were the four-way stops at, at first and second. By the time they get to railroad, they're usually picking up too much steam and often, you know, go through. But the, the stop signs in the first two blocks really, really help. Um, so I could support, you know, four-way stop um, at 4th and, and Filbert. But that said, it seems to me from 4th, Street, you know, up to um, Parissima and Main Street is quite a long stretch, allowing people to pick up, you know, speed again. So you're you're, you're buying yourself, you know, some um, calm with the stop signs there, but people are going to pick up speed for the rest of Filbert Street. So I actually think I can support the four-way stop, but we probably need to look at something else for the rest of that street. I don't know if it's you know, as we redo the street bulbing out or um, the calming strips you were talking about, but I think the four-way stop isn't going to be enough to really solve the problem on that whole stretch. So I think we need to, to, look, at, to look at something additional there. So does that make sense to me as well? So I also don't want to do a study on the stop signs. I think, I, th I think, what I'd like to see us do is have a motion for uh, adding a four-way stop. I, I actually don't care about the speed limit signs. I think they're not effective at all, in my opinion. Um, but the uh, I'd like to see the stop, these stop signs. And then if there is some reason to change them later, then we change them. But let's just put them out there as soon as we can. And then um, look at the, at the addition. I'm getting nodding heads of saying that I'm doing something wrong. But, but I'm the mayor. Don't I get to do that? <laughs> You are the mayor. I, I just want to make sure that we have the information. We, uh, you know, the big joke around cities is everybody's a traffic engineer. Um, so I just want to make sure that we have a real traffic engineer who can give us some good, solid recommendations so that we're not compromising safety. I'm not suggesting I know what the answer is, but I don't want to uh, provide a, uh, a device that is intended to create safety, and it does just the opposite. 
once a stop sign is in, it's um, nearly impossible to take it out. So we just, I just, I, I think what we're saying is we'd like some more op an opportunity to, to do a little more research. Okay, so, so if I may, oh, I'm sorry. So I'll make a comment. I'll pass it to Councilmember Penrose and then Councilmember Frazier. So yeah, I, I am not in favor of spending any more money on traffic engineer studies, period. A stop sign stops people. It cannot create danger. There's no way it could create danger. I, I mean, I'd love to hear the scenario where it did. It may well not be enough but it's something to start with. And we're forever spending money on studies to study things that we can all look at and see this makes sense. I don't, I don't get it. I don't want to spend the money that way. And I can support um, this stop sign there as I, I feel is living in that neighborhood it's needed, um, but it will not solve the problem on that entire street. And so I, I think there is some study, but we can't let these people wait any longer. I know this has been going on a couple of years. I believe there was a study done. If we could go back and look at that, there was something done before. And, and I've talked to the sheriff. I know he was getting, going to put one of the digital readers and how fast you're going. But people do pick up speed in the middle of that road getting to Main Street. So, you know, we could all sit here and agree in a stop sign, but that's not going to solve the whole problem. How about a motion? Um, I know, I know um, city staff doesn't like um, councils to tell you where stop signs should go. Um, <laughs> um, that we're all wearing engineering hats tonight. Um, you know, I, I'm going to say let's put stop signs there because the, the speed limit signs are not going to do it. I, I think we all know. But nobody pays attention. That's the worst motion I've ever heard. Oh, I'm supposed to be official. Let's 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 put some stop signs if it's not going to put us in a situation of of liability. But let's do a study to diagnose the entire block. So if I could. Repeat your motion. Tell me if I got it correctly. Did you say you move to um, to adopt the recommendations per the staff report with changing item two from adding two new speed limit signs to adding two new stop signs at Fourth Street? Is that and to also? Um, further study, uh, review existing information and further study other calming measures for the remainder of that street. That would be correct. Oh, that was well said. Thank you. That is, was well said. Thank there, you. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor respond by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. And I believe that concludes our agenda for this evening. Thank you very much.